So it is my pleasure to introduce Eric Movar. Um, Eric is the executive director of Western Watersheds Project. He's a wildlife biologist with peer-reviewed publications on the role of predation risk in the evolution of group behavior in prey species, and also the role of moose herbivory in, Al in driving Alaskan plant communities and soil dynamics. Eric, you do everything. He has worked for many years to eliminate predator killing programs and promote large carnivore restoration in the Western United States, and is a co-author of the Western Watersheds Project ESA petition to protect wolves in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and parts of Washington, Oregon, and Utah under the Endangered Species Act. Eric, thank you so much for being a part of Speak for Wolves 2022, and I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Well, thank you very much, Rosie. And uh, as you note, I have one slide in my presentation. It's behind me. And among my various talents is not necessarily Zoom backgrounds. And you can see that it's in reverse. So I apologize for that. But I am uh, I am uh, usually headquartered in an office in uh, Laramie, Wyoming, which is the traditional homeland of the uh, Sisistas uh, or Northern Cheyenne peoples and also the Hinono Aitin Arapaho peoples. And right now I'm joining, I'm working remotely from the San Inez Valley of California, which is the ancestral homeland and the current homeland of the Samala or Chumash peoples. So uh, um, wanted to acknowledge those, uh, those original and current uh, land uh, tenures that are, that are there. And uh, essentially, my talk is going to focus on trying to uh, return to an ecologically healthy relationship between humans and wolves. And I think it's, uh, you know, because I am uh, approaching this subject from a, a Euro-American scientific perspective, that's my background, um, I'll start the, start the clock uh, with the arrival of European colonists in North America. And when they came here, there had already been indigenous peoples uh, inhabiting this continent for at least 20,000 years and who knows how much longer. Um, and um, also at that time, uh, they found a continent that, that was rich with wildlife. It had 60 million bison roaming the plains and even in the woodlands of the east. It had 16 million sage grouse out on the sagebrush steppes and out on the Great Plains. It had 10 million elk uh, wandering North America, not just in the forested mountains, but also out in the grasslands. And today, for example, uh, for, or for reference, there are only about a million elk. And during that time, according to a researcher's uh, Leon Leonard and Al, uh, 2005, there were originally 380,000 wolves just in the Western United States and Mexico. So essentially wolves were coexisting, not only with a, uh, a human population in North America, but also with a, a great abundance of prey animals, an abundance of prey animals that, that no one alive today has seen the like of in North America. And so uh, when uh, various interest groups like to say, oh, wolves are gonna wipe out the elk or, or wipe out the deer, it's interesting to look back into, into, uh, into history. And when we arrived, there were 380,000 of them and, and lots more game animals than we see today. And the indigenous peoples had a much different uh, approach to um, native species that they shared the continent with than the Euro-American Euro colonists that came after them. The indigenous peoples uh, really had uh, much more of a, a view that, that's a bit like this model here um, on my left, which is a model in which humanity is in relation to a uh, a connection, uh, a collection of, of organisms that, that's not necessarily uh, hierarchical. Um, whereas when the Euro-American colonists came, they had a very much uh, a, a hierarchical dominance oriented um, view of nature in which humanity was at the top and uh, all other animals uh, were, were down below us. And the Lakota people have uh, a, an expression, um, Tanakwe Oyasin, which means translates roughly as either we are all related or all my relations, which indicates that they saw not just other people, but also other animals as, as interrelated with them. And that both shows that these indigenous peoples had already figured out the discipline of ecology uh, at a time when the Euro-American colonists wouldn't have figured it out for another two or 300 years. Uh, 
and also understood the taxonomy and the relationships between uh, organisms in a much more sophisticated way than the Euro-American colonists that arrived on this continent. And when the first colonists from these European nations came to plant their flags on North American and South American shores, they saw these lands as empty. They claimed them on behalf of their sovereigns back home. And they set about um, bringing in um, uh, colonists to, uh, to tame the land. And they came, these, are, these Europeans came from a real agricultural background. It's much different than the uh, indigenous peoples that they found here for the most part. Uh, because while there were some very sophisticated civilizations like the Incas, like the Aztecs, like the Mayas that, that had uh, very well-developed agricultural systems, there were also uh, subsistence hunting and gathering uh, tribes that were out and bands roaming uh, across the landscape and living um, together with this abundance of wildlife, the likes of which uh, modern people have never seen. And Europeans brought with them their agri not just their agricultural system, but their agricultural biases. And when it concerns wolves, uh, we can all remember it from childhood, perhaps, uh, those of us of a Euro-American background, the tales of Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs, where the wolf is the villain and the evil, dark, deep, uh, fearsome creature that we, we are taught from a very impressionable age to both fear and avoid. And these kinds of myths that were taught, these fairy tales that, that were taught to European children, were taught to them for all kinds of reasons. But Basically, one of them was to instill a fear and loathing of nature and a sort of uh, to, to see nature as a, as, as a frightening place instead of a welcoming place. And that, that uh, inculcation that many of us uh, suffered when we were young, impressionable children has carried forward in our lives and our beliefs today, and it undergirds the way that we see the world. And it, it, has, it offers some explanation, even in the 21st century, why some people of, of a certain age, and I'm one of those people, um, ha have had that background where we've been brought up to believe that wolves are fearsome or enemies. And also, as Euro-Americans moved across the continent, um, they, they carried with them this philosophy of dominionism. And this is a Judeo-Christian philosophy in which uh, humanity was placed here to dominate the earth and have dominion over all of its creatures. And the idea is that uh, nature and all the species and, and, and the land and the vegetation is there basically solely for our use, enjoyment, and exploitation. And this philosophy carried with the, the, um, the North Americans as they moved across the continent and in the initial 13 colonies, the first thing that, uh, that we did was we, we cleared the land of its forests. So we basically destroyed the forest ecosystem as we went. We pulled up the stumps. We, we plowed the land. We planted crops, sometimes crops given to us from indigenous cultures, sometimes crops we brought with us from Europe. And, and the idea was to tame the wilderness. And the wilderness was the enemy and the unknown was the enemy, and the land could only be productive to the extent that it could be converted to agriculture, converted to economic use, and start producing uh, profits to enrich the colonists that were taking over the landscape. And as the colonists expanded, they eliminated the native wildlife that were incompatible with their ways of life. So that meant the large predators were some of the ones that went first, the wolves, the grizzly bears, the mountain lions. But also we trapped out the beaver. We had market hunting for elk, for bighorn sheep. We drove entire species extinct with, with hunting, such as the heath hen and the, um, the Audubon's bighorn sheep. And we, of course, displaced and eliminated indigenous peoples from the landscape and tried to uh, subsume them into the dominant culture. And so that was all part of the conversion of North America from what was initially an ecologically very healthy state in which humanity was very much present, but present in a way that was not so disruptive to the natural processes and not so disruptive to other species and the native biodiversity as our culture is today.
And as uh, the, the uh, nascent American government used that philosophy of manifest destiny to, to move across the landscape, there was a drive to what's called tame the West, to, to make it domesticated. And that really involved in the early stages, pretty informal uh, campaigns to get rid of native wildlife like the wolf. And so in early years, there were bounties where, where paid to shoot wolves and to bring in the, the wolf pelts to be paid uh, a bounty. And when the first national park was established in Yellowstone, uh, the initially there was no park service at that time. So the U S army was placed in charge and uh, the U S army saw its, uh, its mandate to, to protect Yellowstone in a, in a, in a way that was very much in sympathy with and, and conducive to the, the prevailing philosophies of the time. And so one of the things the U S army did was it went about to eliminate wolves and mountain lions and, and other large native carnivores because they were concerned that the bison, which were found in Yellowstone and at that point almost nowhere else because the prevailing culture had wiped them out partially for their hides and tongues and partially to remove the, uh, the economy from the indigenous people that they were hoping to push out of the way. And so, you know, Yellowstone Park from its very outset had a very anti-wolf um, uh, agenda and wolves were indeed ultimately extirpated in, in that region and, and elsewhere in the lower 48 states. In 1915 was the first time at which Congress appropriated funding to kill wolves and that would become a, a, a kind of a long-standing tradition where the federal government took a, a major role in eliminating wolves from the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, in response to this, uh, Aldo Leopold, who worked for the Forest Service and was the father of wildlife management, um, he was involved in this, these efforts to, to kill off wolves in the Gila country of southwestern New Mexico. And in his Thinking Like a Mountain essay, uh, Leopold recounted being a government hunter and going out and hunting and killing wolves and shooting a female wolf and watching the green fire in her eyes die out and wonder in his essay, thinking like a mountain, I wonder if the mountain agrees with me that this is a good idea. And he then went on to point out that the, the wiping out of wolves led to an overpopulation of mule deer in the Gila country, which then had a great impact on the ecosystems there. And Leopold uh, would go on to write the Sand, Sand County Almanac uh, later on and uh, in which that thinking like a mountain essay was was a, a pivotal part. And he became the father of wildlife management in many ways. But his philosophy, which, again, was much more like this idea of, of seeing humanity as part of a larger whole rather than a dominant force, never really took root in the wildlife management uh, kind of tradition and culture in North America. And as we move forward, in 1931, Congress passed the Animal Damage Control Act, in which uh, Congress funded a program to eradicate a whole host of species, including wolves. And this was the, the Animal Damage Control was the agency that later was to become the cynically named USDA Wildlife Services, which is which we know today in the 21st century is going about uh, doing aerial gunning, doing what's called denning, which is uh, where they go and they, they drop gas cartridges into wolf dens to kill the pups in their dens. Uh, they trap, they shoot, they, they, they act as sort of hired mercenaries on behalf of the livestock industry to eliminate any wolves that are deemed a problem, whether they have actually eaten any livestock or are just threatening livestock by being present in areas where livestock are also present. So um, by the time uh, I became a, a, a budding, uh, you know, kind of person who was management, um, the, you know, the, 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 the North American model of wildlife management had become pretty entrenched. And my first experience with, with wolves, really, was watching a 1983 movie called Never Cry Wolf, in which the, the protagonist was a biologist who traveled north for his uh, graduate school um, research project to study wolves and caribou because it was, it was believed 
that that the caribou were being limited and the populations were declining as a re result of wolf predation. And this was based on a 1963 book by the Canadian author, Farley Moat. And in one of those very strange uh, art imitates life moments, um, when I was in, uh, in um, my undergraduate degree at the University of Montana, I was in a wildlife biology course, and I did a, a term paper on the influence of wolf predation on, uh, on caribou. And I ran into uh, a series of articles and a big scientific dispute between Victor Van Bollenberg, who was a Forest Service biologist in Anchorage, Alaska, and Tony Bergerud, who was the leading caribou biologist in the world, who is out of the University of British Columbia. And Bergerud was convinced that the Nelchina caribou herd, which is a caribou herd in South Central Alaska, had been, uh, which had been experiencing population declines. He was, Berger was convinced that this was due to an overpopulation of wolves that was taking too many caribou. And Van Bollenberg studied the data. And what he found was in the Nelchina herd case history, uh, actually what had happened was the herd was subjected to a series of hard winters with late deep snows. And because of these late deep snows, the caribou were in poor condition and the calves weren't surviving and they had very little recruitment of caribou calves. As a result of this, the population started declining steeply, but the Alaska Fish and Game Department did not recognize this population decline. And they assumed that the population was still healthy. So they continued to authorize 10, more than 10,000 caribou to be removed from this herd every year. And according to Van Bollenberg, it was the heavy human harvest on a declining caribou population that really accelerated the decline. And wolves really had not much to do about it. And interestingly, Bergerud and uh, Van Bollenberg kind of got into a, a philosophical battle in the published literature, which was part of my, uh, my term paper. And ultimately, Bergeru lost that fight because he, even after the evidence came forward that it wasn't wolves, that it was these, the, the, the heavy human harvest on declining populations, he, he hung on to that idea that the predators were really the problem here. And he kind of cost himself his, his credibility in his career as a biologist. And then uh, when I, uh, you know, when I was a freshman at the University of Montana, there was a biologist by the name of Les Pengelly. And he taught all of the intro to wildlife management courses. And these were done in the spring semester so that he could take all the classes over spring break up to Yellowstone National Park. And this was before wolves were reintroduced in Yellowstone. So the wolf was still extirpated in that area. And at this time in the mid 1980s, the elk population was so overpopulated that they had completely mown down the Northern range, which was their winter range in the Northern fringes of Yellowstone Park around Gardner. And this elk population had so decimated the, the, their own winter store of food that you, we would go skiing from elk carcass to elk carcass. And it was always the biggest, most giant harem master bulls that had died because the bulls stop eating during the rut in the fall when they're breeding. And they carry on this very vigorous mating and dominance uh, fights with other bulls. And they, they deplete their own reserves of fat and energy in this process. And then they go into winter in very marginal shape and they re rely on having good quality winter range. And so the biggest bulls were just dying like flies on the Northern range of Yellowstone. And Les Pengelly had a ski from carcass to carcass as he taught us that the lack of large native carnivores to limit this population was resulting in this overpopulation of elk, the decimation of the range, and consequently the, um, the elimination of the largest and most vigorous uh, uh, males from the herd. Now, when I went on to the University of Alaska Fairbanks to do my, to do my uh, uh, master's research, uh, I got to, I, I actually had the ability uh, and, and privilege to, to um, publish one paper with Vic Van Bollenberg. And so I actually got to sort of, in a way, live out that narrative in, in the book, uh, Never Cry Wolf and the movie that came after that. And uh, I got to study the effect of 
wolf predation risk and grizzly predation risk on Alaskan moose. And uh, indeed, there was a full complement of, of both moose and wolves in Denali National Park. And on the moose I was studying, they began to group up in, in herds and herd behavior in Alaskan moose began not just as a, as a way of, uh, of, of having more efficient foraging, but also as a means of avoiding direct loss of, of, of life due to predators like grizzly bears and wolves. And so I was able to show how it's the farther you got away from the cover of the forest, the more moose were grouping up into larger and larger groups in order to have safety in numbers. And while I was up there in Alaska, I, uh, I ran into an Alaska Game and Fish Department uh, biologist at one of the conferences I attended. And he told me how uh, aerial gunning was being used in Alaska to eliminate wolves. And in Alaska, the aerial gunning was being pursued in large measure because caribou were felt to be vulnerable to wolf predation. And the, the biologist told me a story of one pack of wolves that was a specialist in moose. And they had gone through and they had killed one of the wolves from this pack. And the wolf they had killed, aerial gunning, happened to be the nose wolf. And it turned out that in this pack, they had one specialist wolf that would go up to the moose, grab hold of the moose's nose in the wolf's jaws and weigh down the forequarters so that the moose could not rear and flail and deal out death to the wolves. And so with, that, with the nose wolf holding down the moose, Another moose could come into the rear haunches and hold down the, the hindquarters. And then the other wolves could come in and could actually take the moose. And of course, Alaskan moose are about 25% larger than moose in Minnesota or, or Eastern Canada. And so they're, they're quite a uh, dangerous prey. Well, once this nose wolf had been removed from the pack, the pack could no longer hunt wolves because they didn't have a second string nose wolf waiting in the wings to fill. And consequently, that wolf pack switched from moose to caribou. And the whole idea to reduce predation on caribou had actually been not just futile, but counterproductive because in, in this particular case, they caused a wolf pack that had been specializing in moose to switch over and start specializing in caribou. And another thing I noted when I was doing my grad school in Alaska was that everybody in wildlife management uh, joined up with what's called the Wildlife Society. And the Wildlife Society is, is a club that's part scientific organization, part Rod and Glenn Club, and, and, and part religious organization. And it's the keeper of, of dogma and orthodoxies in wildlife management. And ultimately, much later, um, I, I guess not much later, but, uh, but somewhat later, um, out of the, the Wildlife Society came... Um, came um, the North American model of wildlife conservation. And this was a sort of, it wasn't, it wasn't a scientific model. It was an ethical or a philosophical model about how to approach wildlife conservation that was put to together by a Canadian bighorn sheep biologist. And uh, basically it had seven tenets. First, that wildlife is a public trust resource in, in, in contrast to Europe, where wildlife is owned as a landowner, by the landowner. Second, an elimination of markets for wildlife, except that there was some loophole for trapping, which was seen as, you know, not, not a violation of that elimination of the commercialization of wildlife. Third, the allocation of wildlife or the taking of wildlife should be by law. Fourth, that wildlife can only be killed for a legitimate purpose. Hunting, of course, defined as one of those legitimate purposes. Fifth, wildlife were considered an international resource, which makes perfect sense when you note that wildlife move freely across international boundaries. Sixth, that science is the proper tool for the discharge of wildlife policy. And seventh, a democracy of hunting, so that wildlife should be equally available to all hunters. And notice that it's not a democracy of wildlife uh, for all people, including non-consumptive users. It's a democracy of hunting. And this uh, North American model of wildlife conservation is really foundational to the approach to state wildlife manage management agencies and federal wildlife management agencies and federal land management agencies as well. And they all look to this North American model as sort of the Bible of wildlife conservation. And it comes with all kinds of baggage. 
And one of the baggages that it comes with is that it doesn't consider the, the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples. And even some of the, the model's own authors have, have been out in the press recognizing this shortcoming, and yet it's never been addressed yet. Another, uh, uh, another aspect of the North American model of wildlife conservation is it, it sees wildlife in very much a commodity lens. So it's very dominionist in its philosophy. And essentially wildlife is, is there um, to, as, as, a, as a resource, as, as something that we, uh, that, that's there for our use, that we're supposed to maximize the yield and we're supposed to harvest it as if it's a crop. And, um, and so this is the philosophy and, and really the, the, um, the, um, the end user of the wildlife is seen as the hunter and the hunter is seen as central to the North American model of wildlife conservation. And I myself am a hunter. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm part of that 4% of Americans that hunt. It's a very tiny minority and it's not the kind of minority that ought to be dominating wildlife management, yet it does because in large part, the uh, state wildlife management agencies get a lot of their funding from tag sales, from license drawings and things of that nature that come directly from the hunting community. And so uh, that portion uh, which comes in from the hunting community makes those agencies somewhat beholden to hunters and look at hunters as their primary customers. So instead of uh, managing wildlife uh, under the public interest or for the public interest, as the North American model of wildlife conservation suggests, it manages hunting primarily as an output for fisher folk and, and hunters. And so it's much more of this realm of kind of top-down controlling managing. And fundamentally, these state wildlife agencies raised from students to believe that they are uh, th that that wildlife need their management, and that without human intervention into natural ecosystems, that the the ecosystems will fall apart. And this is really a kind of a fundamental tendency, not just in the North American wild model of wildlife conservation, but of wildlife management writ large in North America. And as a result of this outcome, you have very interventionist policies. So when it comes to wolves, when it comes to wolves, the natural inclination of these agencies tends to be, well, what do we need to do to manage the wolves? And in the case of the livestock industry, the livestock industry comes forward and with an interest of extirpating the wolf populations, or if they're unable to do that under the law, then they would like to minimize the populations of wolves. And so, uh, you know, this is this, this, and this really goes back again to, to the uh, Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale vision of wolves as a giant threat. Uh, to, to livestock. And that's part of the culture of the agriculture or industry uh, is that they want to eliminate all the species that in any way interfere with them maximizing their profits, maximizing their crop production. And in the case of livestock producers, that's cattle and sheep. Now, in reality, wolves take a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of cattle and sheep every year in those areas that have wolves and cattle both. So in the, the greater Yellowstone area where we have wolves and where we've had cattle and where we've had those for 30 years, uh, there have been very, very few, few cattle and sheep actually lost as a percentage of the overall herds. And even though the livestock industry likes to raise concerns that they will go out of business uh, because of the presence of wolves, grizzly bears, and other large carnivores, the fact of the matter is that in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, there are just as many ranches as there always were, and just as many acres of private land are dedicated to cattle as there were 20, 30, 40 years ago before the wolves came into existence in, in that, in that uh, geographic milieu. Now, interestingly, there have been some studies from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem on the effects of, uh, of um, wolf predation on on those domestic livestock. And the first one was a study by Wilgus and Peebles that, that looked at that uh, 
data set of the number of livestock that had been disappearing every year and how that related to the number of wolves that were being killed in reprisal for, um, for taking livestock. And what uh, Wilgus and Peoples found was, in effect, uh, the exact opposite of what you would think, which is the more wolves you killed, the more livestock you lost. And then there was a second study that was done um, by a second series of researchers that reanalyzed the Wilgus and Peoples data set and said, wait a minute, we think that you use the wrong statistical uh, treatment um, for the assumptions of the model. And we reran the data and we found that the more you kill wolves, you do eventually get a reduction in livestock losses. And then there was a third, um, a third um, study that was done on exactly the same data set by uh, researchers named Campanietz and Evans in 2017, which now turns out to be the final word on, on the subject. And what they found was that the second study itself used an inappropriate statistical model for the data, and, and which, which weren't upheld by the assumptions of the model. And they applied a, a, an even more sophisticated statistical treatment. What they found though was in the short term, more, the more wolves you kill, the more livestock you lose. But eventually, as the wolves increase in population towards saturation in the landscape, you could theoretically get a reduction in a very small reduction in livestock losses. And I, 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 as I recall, that the model, uh, when it was published in 2017, had not yet reached that point. So at that point, the model was still showing that the livestock uh, losses were increasing in response to increasing uh, predator control. But in fact, uh, that at some point in the future, and I think it's still two or three years out, that there ought to be predicted from the model some degree of small um, decrease in livestock losses with increasing um, wolf uh, lethal removal, which is all a very uh, kind of deep dive into the question of, does it even make sense? Does the science support lethal control of wolves in the context of reducing livestock losses? And indeed, so far, it does not. And there have been other studies, and I, you know, we heard earlier from Dr. Santiago Avila uh, about some of his work. One of his studies was from Northern Michigan, where he looked at the uh, effect of, of wolf removals from farms uh, and found that, lo and behold, on the particular farm that you removed a wolf from in response to a livestock loss, you could expect a, 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 sm a slight reduction in livestock losses on that farm. But within the other farms, within a five kilometer radius, those farms uh, it, uh, experienced an increase in livestock losses from wolves. So essentially the, the livestock losses were just being displaced from, from the area where they originally occurred to other surrounding areas. So again, that this was somewhat of a, 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 a counterproductive uh, approach. But this is very much the kind of approach that you would take if you were following this model of uh, interacting with nature, the idea that, that humans must manage it. The reality with wolves is, is a pretty complex reality, but in some ways, I, I think it's instructive to note that before Euro-American wildlife management came to North America, there were plenty of elk, there were plenty of bison, there were plenty of mule deer, in fact, more than we have ever seen since. And that was there in tandem with a population of wolves that was so numerous that we have never seen the like ever since. And the idea that we need, for instance, to reduce wolf populations to increase game numbers is not at all supported um, by, by the experience that we've had and the literature we had so far based on wolf reintroduction. So here I'm going to quote some numbers that, that were generated by Norm Bishop, who's a biologist that was involved in the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone, and just talk about some population numbers. Uh, the wolves were reintroduced in, uh, in 1995 uh, into Yellowstone National Park and increased ever since. And so if you had a major population effect on prey species by these wolves and by this wolf reintroduction, you would expect the numbers of elk to have declined radically um, based as, as time went on. And what we find instead is that in Wyoming in 1995, there were 103,448 elk. 
By 2018, there were 110,000 elk. So lots more wolves, but more elk at the same time. In Montana in 1995, we had 109,500 elk. By 2018, 138,470 elk. So again, an increase, and this, in this time, a fairly significant increase, an increase of about a third in the population, even as wolves were increasing in numbers. And in Idaho in 1995, there were 112,000 elk, and by 2018, there were 120,000 elk. Today, Montana has 136,000 elk, which is slightly less than it had in 2018. But the good news is that that's 50,000 elk that are uh, above the uh, population objective for the state. So the elk are actually more numerous today than the state management agency actually thinks they should be. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the state management plans in some of the most problematic states where we still have no protection under the Endangered Species Act. In Wyoming, we have a wolf management plan that identifies wolves as what's called a predatory animal throughout 85% of the state. So the vast majority of the state, everything except Yellowstone and the surrounding uh, wilderness areas, wolves can be shot at any time, in any number, without a hunting license, with no bag limit, and, uh, and, and there are basically no restrictions other than you, you're supposed to report any wolf kills. And in addition to that, there is a practice called coyote whacking in which uh, some individuals drive around on snowmobiles and run down coyotes and run down wolves, running them over with their snowmobiles repeatedly until the, the, the wolf or coyote is so bludgeoned and so exhausted that they can be picked up and beaten over the side of the snowmobile to be dispatched or it can be killed with a pistol. This is called coyote whacking. And this appears to be uh, the approach of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and local law enforcement, a perfectly legal practice because this was reported when an individual posted some, um, some GoPro videos of himself doing it. And the, um, the local sheriff's deputy went out to the house of this violator um, and, and to inquire as what was going on and, and filed no charges. And in, in, in response to that, there was a state legislature, Mike Yin, who introduced a bill to make coyote whacking illegal. And that bill was killed in committee, which basically shows that this, the Wyoming legislature is, is, is sending a message that this kind of uh, anti-wildlife activity is, is perfectly tolerable and even intentionally legal in the state of Wyoming. So Wyoming has a particularly barbaric history. And Wyoming became the template for the wildlife management plans and, and, and activities in Montana and Idaho. And in Montana, the intent of their wildlife management plan is to manage wolves, which means killing them through hunting, through, through, through aerial gunning and that sort of thing, uh, down to 15 packs or 150 individuals, which is the, the bare minimum that is allowed under the, right, the recovery plan. They introduced new regulations that allow snaring and baiting and, and expanded trapping seasons and night hunting, which, which can be considered uh, unethical by most, uh, by most hunters. And uh, Governor Gianforte himself has, has engaged in the illegal trapping and killing uh, of a wolf without having the trapping permit that was required to any Wyoming, any Montana resident. So, so Montana has a very backward management plan. Idaho itself uh, had uh, an even more draconian approach in which the state legislature basically seized control of state wolf management away from the wildlife management professionals and said, we're going to dictate how wolves are managed in this state. And, uh, and they even had objections from the state game and fish commissioner. Um, and the commission, the commission said they shouldn't do that. And they did it anyway. And they imposed a system that, that, uh, that, uh, had a goal of reducing the wolf population by 90% down to the, again, the bare minimum allowed by the ESA recovery plan, um, allowing all sorts of methods, including night, night hunting, including shooting from motor vehicles, including year round trapping on private lands with no regulation. So, uh, basically it's become a free fire zone for wolves in these three states um, and, and their populations, which is one of the main pot source populations for all the other wolf recovery in the Western United States, has, is very much at risk right now. 
And in addition, Idaho instituted and approved $1 million for wolf boundary bounties to be paid out of the state coffers um, to wolf hunters at one and $2,000 per hunter as a reward for killing wolves. Now let's, let's circle back because I am looking at this through a, a, a Europe, Euro-American scientific uh, way, of, way of viewing the world. Uh, from a science-based uh, from a scientific basis, what is what a science-based wolf management look like? Well, first of all, there's no scientific basis for managing wolf populations through at all, through hunting seasons, through trapping, through aerial gunning. There's no scientific basis for it because wolf populations are, are naturally self-regulating. They're a territorial species that under natural conditions, the leading cause of death for wolves is from other wolves, in territorial disputes as they disperse through occupied territories. And sure, wolf populations will increase with increasing prey populations and territories might get slightly smaller and you might, you might accommodate a few more wolves in the landscape. But essentially, the wolves will never uh, be able to increase their populations to such a degree that they will take a numerous prey population down to a very low level just from, from uh, predation alone. Um, secondly, what science-based wolf management will look like uh, wolf livestock con uh, conflicts managed exclusively by non-lethal means. And that should be applied universally because it does not, it, it does not work to have voluntary adoption of coexistence in a non-lethal sense. And the example of that is the Lava Lake uh, Land and Livestock Company in Idaho, which instituted non-lethal coexistence in a, in a very well-documented program. And they, uh, their sheep operation uh, sustained very few losses from wolves. They had range riders. They had, uh, they had fladry, which is the hanging of, of little strips of, of cloth that wave in the breeze and scare wolves off. And they were very successful. But they were basically the only ranching operation in the region that were using that. And this was instituted to protect a pack of wolves called the, the Phantom Hill Pack in, uh, that had come and colonized the... Um, the uh, the Wood River Valley near Haley, Idaho, and had become very popular amongst the local Sun Valley residents. And in fact, the, when, when the Phantom Hill Pack wandered onto Lava, Lava Lake lands, they did not have a lot of conflicts with the livestock. However, when they were uh, wandering on the lands of, of ranchers that did not subscribe to non-lethal, wildlife services was called in, hunting happened. Uh, killing of wolves happened, and ultimately that Phantom Hill pack was completely extirpated and wiped out uh, as a result of the fact that, that the coexistence model of the, the Wood River uh, kind of uh, wolf program was not universally adopted by all of the ranchers. And that's why it's necessary to have uh, regulations statewide and nationwide that basically say to the livestock industry that Managing your risk of loss to predators is something that you need to do in a way that doesn't involve killing off the native wildlife. And so for a coexistence to work effectively, it needs to be applied uniformly across all the different agricultural producers. And finally, uh, I would say that California has the most science-based wolf management plan of any Western state. And in California, the, the wolf is um, listed under the California State Endangered Species Act, which does not allow the hunting, trapping, or killing of wolves, and does not even allow for wolves to be killed in reaction to losses of livestock uh, in all cases. So, you know, the livestock have to be well documented. So, uh, essentially, uh, that is, that's the model that we should be working towards, I think, for science-based uh, wildlife management. And, and essentially, what I'd like to close with is this idea that, that we would like to get to this, this sort of model of human-wolf relationships in which humanity is an animal, and so are wolves, and so are bison, and so are elk, and so are beavers, and they all exist in a complex, ecologically uh, rich web of interrelationship that we may not know enough to be able to manage. And the idea that we can be this top-down micromanager of wildlife systems, and the idea that we can, uh, that we have the knowledge to tinker with this very complicated, very complex machine is really 
pretty arrogant of us based on the fact that, you know, as a biologist, I can say uh, that in wildlife biology, if you can explain 39% or 43% of the variance or, of, of the, the explanation of the factors that are, that, are, uh, that are influencing any one particular phenomenon, you're really doing quite well which leaves the majority of the information that is, that is affecting that same phenomenon unknown. And we need to acknowledge the unknowns and take a more precautionary approach in which we say, you know, much like the doctors say, uh, first do no harm. That ought to be an approach for wildlife management. And with wolves, really knowing everything that we know about interactions between wolves and big game, knowing everything that we know about wolves and their interactions with livestock, really the most effective, the most scientifically based, and the most ecologically responsible approach is to go back to this idea that we are just one of many species in an interrelated and interconnected web, and that we are not the top of the pyramid that's there to to, uh, to hold everything in check and manage all the outcomes because we can't. And I'm hoping that we can move forward into this model and we have so much to learn from the indigenous communities, their traditional ecological knowledge and their, uh, and their philosophical underpinnings that understood so much better than Euro-American science-based culture understands today uh, that 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 I am looking very much forward to uh, to uh, talks that we see from indigenous folks here at the Speaks for Wolves conference. So so thank questions. So so Rosie, I'll turn it over to you. Eric, thank you so much. I really appreciated that you didn't necessarily have slides, but it would you, you tied everything back into your background, which was great. Um, I do have a couple questions um, that I want to just ask you before we take a quick break. How are pre-European contact population numbers for wolves, bison, elk, et cetera, calculated? And how do we know these numbers are fairly accurate? That's a great question. In the case of Leonard and others, he created an entire model that went through, you know, kind of the idea of, you know, what is the what is the uh, the land area? What is the carrying capacity of the land? What is the reproductive potential of the female wolves? Um, and, and essentially, what we do know from the early explorers is that wolves were ubiquitous. They were there from sea to shining sea in every conceivable type of, of ecosystem in, in North America and down into Mexico. And uh, so he went and did a sophist very sophisticated model. And, and that's, that's how these numbers are generally generated, is that you take the knowledge that you have about the, the populations, about the carrying capacity of the habitats and how they naturally uh, function today and how many of them fit in the landscape. And then you project backwards and then you kind of cross check those results with the, the historical record that you have to see, is that a reasonable outcome or not? Thank you for that, Eric. And then one last question. Um, how do you see that fear that you were talking about that was instilled in us as children manifest in wolf conservation and policy today? Well, you, you see this all the time. And, uh, you know, my organization, Western Watersheds Project, it was, was many uh, one of a number that were part of the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project that, that, that worked on Colorado wolf reintroduction. And we had, uh, you know, a Stop the Wolf Coalition as one of several coalitions of trophy hunting groups and ranchers that came forward and fought that proposition. And part of that was a very orchestrated campaign to pose wolves as a violent threat, as, as something that was a danger to, to human health and safety, as something that was an immediate threat to the entire livestock industry, as something that would be disruptive to the way that Coloradans wanted to live their lives. And that took the form of, of opinion editorials that they published, uh, newspaper article uh, quotes that they had, and, uh, and materials that they were providing um, kind of through their own organizing to their own memberships and people that they could influence, and, and mainly on the Western Slope of Colorado. And one of the interesting uh, ploys that they had was they, they tried to take this, this idea that, you know, that we're all kind of in, intimately, um, you know, and kind of inherently 
um, bias towards seeing wolves as a threat by saying, well, wolves carry disease. They have this disease called hydatid disease that, that's present in their feces. And, 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 and that's going to be a major public health risk for all Coloradans who like to go outdoors and, and whatnot. And basically, you know, if you don't pick up and ingest wolf scat and, and you don't rub it on your lips, you're not going to get high data disease. You, it's almost impossible for humans to get that from, you know, a, a few wolf droppings scattered at great, you know, at great distances across the landscape. But this is the sort of fear mongering that you see in Catron County, New Mexico, during the reintroduction of Mexican wolves. You saw ranchers saying they were going to have to build cages so that their kids could go inside the cage as they waited at the bus stop so they wouldn't be eaten by wolves. This is a direct outgrowth of the Little Red Riding Hood myth in which the wolf is hidden in human clothing, waiting to pounce on the small child and, and have them for dinner. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that wolves, they, they pose very little danger at all to humans. I believe that there are two, um, two instances in, in the last 20 years of, of humans being killed by wolves in North America. Um, I myself, when I was out hunting in the Alaska range across from Denali National Park, um, I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was walking through an open white spruce woodland and I, and I saw a couple of foxes jump up and I, and I, I looked at them through my glass to see that they were foxes and I had no interest in, 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 in hunting them. Of course, I was hunting moose. And, um, and, and then as I hunted on, uh, the, the little foxes set up a pitiful howling. And they weren't foxes. They were pups of the year. And as I stood there, from 30 yards up the hill came the howls of the pack. <laughs> from 30 yards away. So I had the pitiful, pitiful little wailing of the pups. <laughs> and the howling of wolves in stereo. And I turned in 360 degrees to memorize every color, every scent, every sight that I have. And I call that memory up to this very day. And it was really one of the most, uh, maybe the most spectacular memory I have in my entire life. And I was never in any danger, despite the fact that I was in between uh, an entire pack of large carnivores and they're young. Imagine if that had been a grizzly bear. I probably wouldn't be here today. The grizzly bear would have neutralized me as a threat, but wolves are so much in, in the mode of avoiding humans that I, I can't imagine that it, that it ever even occurred to the wolves to attack me as a human. And, and that's how really the, the Little Red Riding Hood myth is, is such a disservice to us because it causes us to, to misunderstand the wolf, to misinterpret the wolf, and really lose the fact that the wolf is one of the safest species of wildlife out there. I was almost killed by moose several times when I offended them in different ways and, and had moose come after me, and, and they could have easily killed me if I hadn't promptly retreated. And, and there are many, many other species out there that, uh, that will be more deadly than wolves. For example, cattle kill a, an average of 22 humans every year. But are we trying to eradicate cattle because they're a human health risk? Of course not. So I, I think it's time to get real about the mythology that we have built up around these creatures. And part of that, uh, that growth as a species that we have it coming to realize that that these large uh, large carnivores that might have scary looking teeth aren't really that much of a threat to us as humans uh, sets us on more of a path towards co coexistence in which we get to live with the wolf, we get to enjoy the wolf, we get to hear the howl of the wolf without having all that fear and stress that 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 really not only interfere with our own enjoyment and, 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 and life and, and, and happiness, but also prevent us by, by putting blinders on us, uh, prevent us from having a healthy relationship with nature more, more, more broadly. Thank you for sharing that beautiful picture. Um, I'm just like, I just played that out in my mind that that was gorgeous. Thank you for 
um, leaving us with that, Eric. And I'm, we're going to leave you on as a presenter so you can answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A since we're running a little short on time. Um, but thank you so much. I appreciate you being here.